Okay, so we're going to finish out this series of lectures this week with what I like to call Bonanza and the Populace. Um, we're still in the Reconstruction phase, uh, but we're going to kind of step away from the South and we're going to look northwest and sort of how the government is going to deal with things over there. Now, you may think of the South and the radical Republicans who are enacting all these laws, revoking pardons, they were interfering a lot with, uh, with the system down there. Well, the liberal Republicans are in power now, and remember, they're all about the free market. They believe that you should just let the invisible hand of the market guide whatever happens out there. And so, if you're in government, and you have all this power to wield, what's the best thing you can do if you really have this philosophy of letting the free market rule? Well, you sell land very, very cheap. Uh, you give it to people so that they can use it to their own devices and let the free market take reign. And that's what they're gonna do. And this is gonna open up all kinds of opportunities all over the West. And these opportunities are going to really, really attract people on the eastern side of the country. They're going to want to experience what's known as bonanza. Bananas, bananas. Bonanza is basically a giant money-making opportunity. And people are hearing stories all the time about folks going out west and making millions off of uh, ranching, making cattle, you know. Uh, there are folks who are finding gold and silver in the mountains. There are folks who are opening up these big farms out there on this incredibly fertile soil. Um, there's dreams of all these things happening and it begins to sort of seep deeply into the American psyche and it's going to cause movement. People are going to start moving out in droves to get a hold of this land and to experience their own version of Bonanza. But that's just an opportunity. The reality of this particular period was a little bit more severe. Um, most didn't get rich. Um, the fact is that the dreams were just dreams a lot of the times. Uh, cattle, people who sought to go out there and do the whole ranching thing, they quickly found that water was a very big issue and if you control the water, you control all the cattle. And all these folks who went out usually just became cowboys and ended up making about as much as you would if you were in a factory on the East Coast. For the folks who uh, went to find gold or silver, well, they usually ended up working on mine as a miner. As for uh, the farmers, you know, they would get these big swaths of land, but they would actually end up going bankrupt most of the time. Um, it's a pretty messy world. And people begin to ask why. Why is it that the opportunity does not match the reality? Well, it all has to do with this idea right here. A national marketplace, okay? Basically, here's the idea. No one is an island anymore. Before the Civil War, the South was kind of its own thing. Even states were their own thing. South Carolina was its own economy, and Alabama was its own economy, and New York was its own economy. But now, the modern world, modern in that particular period, demands a national economy. Think about it. There's a lot more transportation now. Railroads, they're making things go so much faster. We've connected the West Coast to the East Coast. Steamboats are going up and down rivers, and uh, they're making river travel much, much, much faster. And we have better roads that are being built constantly to make the transport of goods all the easier. Not to mention communication is better. We have the telegraph, which is allowing people to communicate instantaneously for the first time ever. It's unbelievable. We also have uh, specialization starting to happen. People are specializing in, say, one crop, or um, it's a factory that manufactures one good. Uh, no one is doing the subsistence farming anymore. Why is all this stuff happening? Well, the fact is people have to adjust, okay? Like, when we deal with these new transportations, you get these folks who've done things one way for years and years and years, and then all of a sudden, everybody has to make deals with the railroad. Everybody needs to communicate to their buyers and sellers through the telegraph. 
Nobody is uh, planting multiple crops now. Everybody's doing one single cash crop because that's the best way to make money. Adjustment is quite difficult during this period, and many, many people sink under the weight of the national marketplace. For one, there's dependence on new technology. We talked about that. You are dependent on your railroad. If you cannot make a good deal with your railroad company, you're in trouble. You can't sell your crop. You know, it's not like you can go to the local market and sell it. You have to participate in the national economy. Also, there's a great deal of issues when it comes to inheritance. Let's say you own a farm, you know, it does all right and everything like that, but then the time comes to uh, you die and you have a will and you leave it to your children and you have four kids. You divide that farm four ways. Not everybody wants to farm. Some sell it all. Some, um, and one kid wants to keep the farm so he keeps one little tiny parcel of it, but he wants to buy it back. How does he buy it back? Well, he has to go to a loan to a bank and get a loan for this and all to maintain this property that was supposedly left to the family. And you have to have more and more land to meet the demand of the national marketplace. So what ends up happening is you keep taking out loans to buy more and more land and it keeps getting divided as people die and pass away and nobody's sure who owns the land or if we need more land here or there. And we get into these big debt situations farmers all over the Midwest especially. So, if that made sense, <laughs> um, there's going to be reactions to, this, to these struggles, to this adjustment difficulty that folks are happening, having with this national marketplace. And the reaction is farmers and what's called well, a co-op. A co-op is basically working collectively for a better price. So let's say the railroad is really expensive. Well, if you and all the other local farmers agree to um, pile all your crops into one big shipment, you can probably save a lot of money on your railroad because they work collectively and they are very, very successful. And people start to take note of it and start doing it all over the place. Eventually these co-ops become so powerful that they begin to get a little bit political and form what is called the Farmers Alliance. Farmers Alliance is going to be huge. I mean, we're talking millions of members. There's going to be over a million in Arkansas alone. 500 chapters in Texas that's going to pop up all over the place. Farmers are going to get together, work together for their own political gain. Um, they're even going to have black chapters. Um, a lot of um, African Americans are in the same spot as these poor white farmers. This is going to be a point of unity for them. And they begin to set political roles and they begin to um, elect people to political office. They're so successful that in Nebraska, Minnesota, and South Dakota, they're going to completely control the state legislature. And they have some pretty radical beliefs that they really want to push these farmers alliances. A couple big ones I want to point out to you. Number one, state ownership of the railroads. Railroads are a big deal, guys. When I'm talking about those prices, they have been known to gouge those prices before talking about farmers negotiating with the rail guy. If the government owns it, that means that the price is guaranteed to be low and fair. There can't be any price gouging. Okay? Uh, you basically take it out of the free market. You can tell that the farmers aren't too big on that. Um, they believe in graduated income tax. That's this idea that the more money you make, the more tax you should have to pay. Okay? Again, supporting the poor farmer, attacking that guy who's got all the land, all the money, everything like that. They also want the prohibition of land being owned by foreigners. What does this mean? We don't want any foreigners coming in and buying massive amounts of land. This is in response to a lot of uh, mainly British investors coming in and buying 10,000 acre farms as uh, an investment venture. <clears throat> this um, very quickly begins to put the smaller farmer out of business as they can. The sheer mass of product that these uh, huge 10,000 acre farms can generate. Okay? So, this is what the farmers will ask for, and they're just going to keep getting more and more power. But what's going to happen is they're going to even morph again from the co op and the farmers alliance into the populist party. They're going to become a full fledged political party 
with their own goals and their own agenda. In fact, they're going to be the most serious threat to the two-party system in U.S. history. These are very powerful guys, and they're going to wield Indian power significantly. Here's what the Populist Party wants, okay? Government-owned banks, railroads, and telegrams. So they're stepping it up. It's not just the railroads anymore. They want the telegrams, the communication control, and they want the banks control because so many farmers have gone out of uh, business from becoming bankrupt. Uh, we also have graduated income tax, an eight-hour workday. This is to appeal to farmers out, I mean, excuse me, factory workers out east. Um, that eight-hour workday is something that everyone really, really wants. It's deep in the discussion as we're at the heart of the industrial world. Um, we need to restrict immigration. Uh, they don't want, again, foreigners coming in and taking land from these small farmers. Uh, we also have uh, low interest rates is a big concern. Again, having to do with those banks, those high interest rates are what cripple farmers. More public schools, big believers in education. They also want to end the convict labor system. Why? I'll explain that in just a minute. There's a deep connection with black folks here. And finally, um, they like the free and unlimited coinage of silver. Um, and the reason they want this is because it will mean more money in the economy and less interest for the banks to tax people. Okay, that's sort of a complicated issue, but the big thing there is less interest. It's all about making these banks less powerful. That's really what they want to push. Okay? So the populist party comes around and they really resonate with Americans. I mean, this is a big party, millions of members, but who they especially click with are African Americans. Blacks and the populace have much in common. Okay? Basically, the same laws that affect all those blacks, the ones we went over in the previous videos, um, that are things like poll tax and fence laws. These hurt farmers, poor farmers, just as much as black folks. I mean, if you're a poor farmer and you have to pay a couple bucks to vote, a couple bucks can be the difference between eating or not eating. It's a big deal. And they begin to feel a kinship with these folks. So they start to work together. The populists are going to appoint the first blacks to public office. I mean, that's a big deal. It's a huge step in the right direction. And they're also going to support public schools for blacks and whites together. So. An unlikely, um, actually it's not unlikely, it's a likely alliance between blacks and the populace. And it's going to really make them a threat um, to have this, um, this power, this whole new demographic to add to their movement. However, there's going to be a reaction to blacks being in this movement. All the way up here. People seeing these black folks and populace working together and it starts to make Democrats especially shiver a bit. We don't like that black folks are coming into public office, that they're almost equal to white people. So they look at it as a challenge to white supremacy. The 1890s are what we call the nadir. That's N-A-D-I-R. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Period for black folks. It may be the worst time to be black in our nation's history. Worse than being a slave. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is there's going to be a lot of tension from black starting to finally get a foothold in society. And uh, newspapers are going to start to talk about uppity blacks. Um, these are black people who don't know how to behave. A lot of this has to do with the uh, myth of little black Sambo, who um, was sort of this ignorant, happy-go-lucky slave who, um, you know, he was dumb, but he was very polite and very kind and not threatening in any way. That was the old image of black people. But now newspapers and such begin to, uh, begin to push this new image of black folks. And this new image is going to be the black male rapist, okay? Um, what's going to happen is the idea of the cocaine-fueled, lustful black man raping an innocent white woman. There's going to be stories happening all the time of um, these crazed black men just having their savage way with these pure white women. And it's 
really going to sink deep into the southern psyche, and not to the American psyche, you could say. And uh, people are really, really going to uh, take this to heart. So um, this is when police change their weapons from 22 calibers to 38 calibers, um, because the idea was that these blacks were so cocaine-filled that the only way you could take them down was with a 38 caliber um, bullet. So it's almost like the good white race is struggling against these savage blacks, you know? And what happens because of this idea is lynching explodes across the country. Thousands of lynches are going to happen in the next year, in the, the, from the 1890s on. Um, people are really going to look at blacks as be, needing to be controlled. Slavery kept them in check, but now that they have tasted freedom, they've become wild with savagery. And um, this is going to lead to so many lynchings that um, it's going to start to shock people. Eventually, we meet this guy named Walter White, not to be confused with Breaking Bad's Walter White. Walter White is a black person who looks like a white person. He was the president of the NAACP for a while, but um, he actually witnessed some of these lynchings and wrote about it and published his work across the country. And America was completely shocked by it, um, so much so that people really said something has to be done. So everyone looks to the South, and the South says, okay, we're going to put in a new set of laws. Enter Jim Crow. This is where we get the Jim Crow laws, the 1890s. Folks are finally going to say, okay, blacks and whites, we just can't have them together. Separate them. There will be a black thing over here and a white thing over here, and that will be the case for everything from water fountains to schools to buses. We'll just divide everything up. It's the only way we can't have these savage people living with these pure, innocent white people stuff. And that's where we get Jim Crow laws. And there's going to be a lot of trouble coming from them, I can tell you. But I hope that big long journey made semi-sense. We talked about the populist party coming to power, power and that kind of leads into um, black folks uh, gaining some power, but also losing some power too through Jim Crow. And, the idea of the black male rapist, and we also talked about Bonanza a little bit. I know this one seems particularly all over the place. Here's what you got to know. The free market came in. Farmers reacted to the free market and said, hey, we don't feel like we have any power here. They formed this giant party, the populist movement, and it's going to have real political power. It's going to take over legislatures and states. Okay, it's going to put up a national fight. It's going to put up presidential candidates. Okay? We also have uh, blacks getting a voice through the populist party. And the reaction to blacks getting power in the populist party from white supremacists. And this is all going to be leading into more stuff that will hopefully tie all this together. But that's week one of lecture, so I hope that helped out a little bit. Please let me know if there's anything else I can do. That's it. Bye.